Hi, everybody. My name is Jonathan Fisher, and I'm here today with the Pacific Northwest Railroad Archive and the Northern Pacific Railway Historical Association. You know, we've been doing these uh, PNRA Zoom programs now for about four years, and the, the trick or the goal is trying to come up with a way to keep this programming fresh and interesting for our viewers, and that's what keeps our viewers coming back. So today we're doing a couple of unique things with our program. First, we're doing two programs in one, se in one day session. Our first program today will be at 11 a.m., and then we'll have a little halftime. We may have some halftime guests show up. We'll see. And then we'll have a second program starting at 1 p.m. Um, the other thing that we're doing today that's very unique for us is we are on the road. We're actually making a field trip. So we're going to be live today from the Highline Heritage Museum here in Burien, Washington. So, gee, people say, well, that's not very far. PNRA is only a block away. But, you know, we're, we're out in the field and, and doing a field program today. And we've got a really great pair of programs for your enjoyment. First, my dear friend, our dear friend, Jack Christensen, will be talking about the connecting train that ran from Tacoma to Auburn, East Auburn. And then after our break, Gary Tarbox will be back talking about the development of Northern Pacific Railway steam passenger power. So with that, I, I know everybody to come see me. So I'm going to be happy to turn this over to my dear friend Gary Tarbox and Jack Christensen. Guys, take it away. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, the Tacoma Connection, which is one of the really interesting jobs that uh, Jack had in his career. The purpose of the Connection really was to bring Tacoma passengers to and from the NP's uh, transcontinentals. And uh, the, I wanted to point out, though, that some of those trains ran, the uh, connections ran after dark. So what we're going to show here is our uh, representative photos that uh, we'll, we'll show you uh, what it looked like when there was enough light to capture a, a good picture. So there were four connections um, that were made. Uh, the first one in the morning was at 645 uh, connection with uh, train number one, which is, of course, the, the North Coast Limited, and that was called 410. Then we met the uh, Alaskan uh, train four uh, at 840, and then the e evening connections were train five at six o'clock, and uh, the, the uh, uh, eastbound North Coast Limited train two. One of the things I wanted to uh, make sure everybody remembers is that westward trains were always odd-numbered uh, trains, and eastward trains were even numbers. Um, Jack only really worked on the evening connection, so that's the, those are the two we're going to talk about today. Uh, the first evening connection was the 414, uh, meeting the westbound uh, train number five to pick up passengers at East Auburn. The, um, looking at the basically the route of, hey, uh, we're going to go from Tacoma. We're going to pick up the cars at, uh, and run dead uh, train over to East Auburn, which was, of course, slightly south and, uh, and east of Auburn. And it was on the uh, the transcontinental line that uh, that went there uh, went all the way back to St. Paul. Yeah, yeah, up there. Um, we also, the connection also provided services to passengers at uh, Puyallup and Sumner and Auburn depots. Interestingly enough, the, because Auburn was just a stone's throw from East Auburn, a, a few, well, a number of blocks away, they still would connect uh, take pe uh, passengers from uh, the transcontinental lines and then take them over to Auburn Depot so that the transcontinental didn't need to make two stops in Auburn. So here's uh, Jack and Max King uh, in a, a 1954 shot. 
uh, with their favorite engine, the uh, 2194. Um, Jack really enjoyed working with Max. Uh, and Max was an author. What t tell us about working well, with him. Uh, he got to writing to the Tacoma News Tribune, uh, railroad stories, hunting and fishing stories, uh, stories. He would go out to these villages out in uh, Washington State and get a hold of the oldest people in town. And he had a tape recorder. He'd have them uh, relate their uh, some of the vignettes of their life. And uh, uh, it provided a little bit of uh, uh, material for the Tacoma to do the Tribune Sunday Rotogravier, you know, the, the, the Sunday papers. And uh, he would write about, uh, I mean, he would write about railroading, railroad people, uh, about uh, hunting, fishing, and um, and uh, the lumber mills, and uh, how it was in the early days. And he got to be, had quite a following in Tacoma News Tribune. And, um, I, uh, I was uh, doing a little artwork then and taking a course in art. So I started doing a, um, the covers for the Sunday Roto Gravera. We used a kind of a crude letterpress on the uh, news, newsprint. It wasn't glossy, but uh, so I do these opaque watercolors. And uh, we started while we were working this job. And uh, in 1965, I accepted promotion as a road foreman of engines. The job was in Duluth, Minnesota, and my wife was willing to move our family and give up a nice new house. But uh, I even did this work when I was living in Duluth. I would, uh, by mail, I'd mail a, a painting home that matched an article in the in the uh, in that particular paper. That's if you did one about uh, passenger train hitting a bowler and a Rock thought I did a, a painting showing that. If he wanted the uh, operation of a lumber mill, I did one of a McKenna mill. I remember doing one of a fishing boat, um, Alaska cannery. Uh, so we did, uh, and we'd work on these projects while well, between trips on this night connection. So That's great. Go back into the cars and, and yeah. sit down at a table and work together. You yeah, will talk about that, the whole routine. What? What? Okay. So, what time did you guys go on duty? Well, we went on duty about four thirty at the D Street Roundhouse. Uh, the cars were over in the depot. We had switched in there in both ends of UD, the, the main depot in Tacoma. They'd line us into the proper track, and. Uh, we couple onto the train while the carmen were looking anything over, trying the air. Conductor would come down with the orders. Um, we'd get our clearance, and our, we had to have orders. And uh, we'd compare, he would compare watches with the engineer. And uh, Max was, uh, he'd been, uh, he had, I guess he said he broke his back falling off a cold deck when he worked in a logging camp. He was a little bit crippled up, but uh, he would let me run the engine. So, and this, the 2194 was hand-fired. And I just thought, that's kind of a tough gig for Max to shovel coal into that steam. But uh, the deal was that we went out in the morning or the evening. The first trip was with dead-head equipment. No, no passengers. We're going over to meet number five. So I got to run the engine when they didn't have any passengers. Huh. Well, you were you were a full engineer at that time, though, too. Uh, 53, yeah, I was, uh, I was promoted in 1951, yeah, uh, January 51. So this this map is sh really showing you the <clears throat> the layout of Tacoma. Yeah. And you'll notice that the, the double black lines is the, yeah. the main line coming through. Um, going through the yard and then up uh, past the Union Station. The green line that breaks off from the line is what we call the drawbridge line because it went across the Theophos waterway and then turned and came. You could come into the Union Station that way. Um, 
And the nice thing about that was that the engine and the, actually the whole train was turned around so that it was ready to go back to Auburn uh, for the next run. So um, here's, here's a picture of uh, the deadhead equipment leaving uh, Tacoma Union Station. Uh, typical consist was a coach and uh, a baggage car, but occasionally there was uh, two coaches. We run extra to and uh, uh, to Tacoma, and you'll notice the white flags on this engine. So we are actually running extra. Uh, I would uh, uh, load the firebox up as much as I could. The, the, the back corners and the sides put as much coal in, and of course that made a lot of smoke. But uh, I, I don't know. We have a picture of a butterfly fire door that was it was. Panel operated, air operated door to fly open, you know, what you, but it had a handle where you could move it manually. So when you put a lot of coal and make, make a lot of smoke, you could tack that door a little bit, a little air, and that would cut the smoke down. So I'd load that firebox up as much as I could. So, and then and Max would just play with that handle to keep the smoke down. He wouldn't have to get off his seat box and shovel coal where we were almost at Fiala. So, and uh, well, of course we'd stop at Fiala and he'd put in another fire between Fiala and Sumner. We call it putting in a fire. We're just kept re re filling up the back, keeping the back corners and sides banked and a little light and bright in the middle. And then uh, leaving Sumner was the last fire to, and uh, we hit the Stuck River Bridge doing about 70 or 75, and and uh, uh, you know, sh shut, uh, shut the throttle off and slammed the reverse lever down so you could coast all the way to Auburn. And the first trip, you went down, coasted down the main line, and you, you had a switch tender at the north end of Auburn Yard. He would line you around the Y toward East Auburn. And you get down there and get into the siding and wait for number five. That was the dead end trip. And so that this is the picture of the north. Yeah. You know, and you'll see that there's an eastbound and westbound main, and that makes no sense because it's north and south, of course, at that point. Except it makes railroad sense that the railroad dis determined that anything coming from St. Paul to Seattle is going west. But when they first started the railroad, they actually went through Portland. So when you come north from Portland, you're going west, <laughs> which actually makes no sense because the interesting thing is when you get on the, the uh, main line, east and west is different. And so you actually, you are going east and all of a sudden you, you're west when you get on the main. <laughs> so anyway. So the, so this is this show, shows you where the roundhouse was and uh, and the thing. And there's two. You'll notice there's two lines going for what we call the Tacoma leg of the Y. Yeah. Well, this this hour one's yeah. They'd head us around. This was a hand operated switch here. This was a spring switch, and this inner track was used for freight trains leaving Auburn's yard for for Yakima, so they wouldn't have to line back. They'd They'd just go through this. They'd get a signal indication. The switch in would line us across from this main, and so and we'd get to our brakeman to take care of this switch, which is normally for the Seattle leg. Put us into this siding, and we'd wait for number five. That was the connection. So we, we actually were headed east, and that was a little refreshment stand there, and that was quite a gathering for people. There was a depot there, too. Got to be quite a place, and during the war, it was a kind of a busy spot. Um, but that—that's the way of the layout. And so here, here we are, have uh, 1677 at East Auburn, headed in at East Auburn, uh, and you'll see that there's a the passenger train that they're loading onto uh, or off of, I should say, and loading on the uh, connection or is across the uh, 
umbrella uh, shed from the, from the connection. So this is um, really at, uh, at, at 6 uh, well, the, 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 the mainline train was, was scheduled to head on into Seattle starting at 6 o'clock. And then uh, 1440, the, the connection would then back out, and it's scheduled to leave actually at 6 08. Uh, it would back around the the Seattle sure. leg of the Y. Let's let's yeah. go back to this one. Now they were asked to number five left to the switch center up at Auburn and line them on to the north of the main here. After number five left, we would back out around the Y, and by that time, the switch center would have us lined through the crossover to the depot. And then, then there's, that's when we assumed our schedule was, what, 414, is it? Uh, yeah, that was that, that was uh, 608. Yeah, so, so then we head out for Sumner. But they'd back around, and then yeah. if there was a... Uh, a Anybody came Auburn. in on number five and wanted to be at Auburn Depot or East Auburn, he could just stay on our train and get off at Auburn. Yeah. And, of course, the, any mail had to be dumped there, too. But So we'd be heading on as 414. Then. So here's uh, a, what it looks like for the um, 2216 uh, leaving Auburn. If you no, notice way in the back there, the Auburn Depot yeah. uh, is so that, there. Yeah. So it's, it, they've just come around the Y and are, are moving down the track at this point. So the first uh, stop then would be Sumner. Uh, and this is looking uh, west. Here was the main, yeah. yeah. Looking south, yeah, actually. Yeah, south, but. <laughs> it's interesting now uh, with the BNSF, the BN and BNSF, the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the um, directions have been reversed again. Yeah. Going south, you're uh, on a bird. East to North here, eating them. That's because the Stampede Line is not the is not the main line anymore. It's the Great Northern. So uh, these uh, directions have been changed more than once. This is a good something. There was some very sheds in the year for. And then well, we're sc scheduled really for the stop at, at uh, 619. So it's really, it's only 7.4 miles south of Auburn. So it's a fairly quick trip. And then we, we go to, to Puyallup, which is on the north side of the, of the line. And so this is how it would look coming into it. And it was on a, a 626 uh, start time. It's only three miles south of of Sumner, and then here's a, a picture of uh, twenty two sixteen approaching uh, uh, reservation. Now the important fact there is that getting back to here, this is where reservation would align the switch to leave the main line and go on the drawbridge line. Do yeah, he lined it through the yard here, and I was over. The where it crosses over the double track, there was a tower there, a 15th Street Tower, and they'd line us down into the depot. And then here's a, a picture of the bridge, the, the drawbridge. Of course, this is a 1927 shot, but it uh, didn't change that much. It was there in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, and you're looking at it from the east side of the bridge, so it's it's the way the train would have uh, the connection would have uh, actually uh, seen it. And then here's another picture of a connection coming across after it's gotten off the drawbridge, coming across the main line uh, and draw, ready to drop into the uh, uh, Tacoma Union Station. And then here's another shot of uh, a connection coming down. And you'll notice, by the way, that He's hauling extra baggage cars on this this part, uh, yeah. whereas this is another one that has uh, two coaches rather than uh, uh, one coach. And then finally, we're in the Coma Union Station, 
and uh, we're, we're getting set to, uh, so uh, this is really the conclusion of, uh, of 414 connection, number for train 414, and that scheduled to be in there at 645. Um, the connection then is scheduled to leave uh, as train uh, 411 at 940. So there's uh, essentially three hours of layover. We'd sit in the coaches and Max would work on his articles and I'd work on my, uh, I did this, I did some pen and ink sketches for the ruler of the beer with him to go in inside with the article as well as the, the painting for the cover. So we generally have a couple of pen and ink sketches. We got 25 bucks <laughs> for our work, for the painting and 25 for any article that uh, Max did. Of course, that was a time frame when uh, candy bars were, were five cents. And, and uh, things were a little mad. <laughs> Money was really worth something. $25 was actually something you could yeah. uh, live on for a day yeah. or two. And uh, <laughs> we just sit there. That was our free time. And if you had a lunch with you, you could eat lunch. You'd sit in the coaches. And then we'd get out of here. When number two left, uh, Max would take over, and we knew the whole routine, Puyallup, Sumner, and uh, when you got to, to Auburn, then you went up to the depot instead of going through the yard. You went up to the depot with 411, was it 411? Yes, 411. And then uh, uh, then your station work at Auburn, you'd back around to East Auburn, get an get in the siding again, wait for number two. After number two went, we all got rid of all your passengers, your dead end, and I'd take over. I'd be run the engine, and we'd head around through the yard. We'd line ourselves around the wall, and the switch tender at the north end of the yard would line us through Auburn, the north end of Auburn Yard onto the main, we just highball for Tacoma with no stops. You didn't have to spot me. See, a lot of the uh, skilled work was spotting me your cars for the baggage and fast years, and you got a lot of that on these connections. Same way with 402 at night, 402. They made 20 stops going through the portal. You got a lot of practice handling air brakes from a high speed to a stop and spotting in a certain spot. Uh, so, but uh, when you had that as equipment, you didn't have to worry about that. So we're, we're now uh, uh, connection 411, and here we are leaving Tacoma uh, for East Auburn. Uh, we're deadhead, uh, we're not deadheaded, we're actually loaded with passengers at this point. Yeah, you don't have any white flags here. Yeah, and we're uh, tells, tells you the story. You're, when you're running extra, you're carrying white signals. And we're going to be stopping at uh, Puyallup, Sumner, and Auburn because those are scheduled stops on, on our way to uh, East Auburn. And it, here we are arriving uh, near the Y in Auburn. Um, today we've got uh, two coaches and a and the baggage car. We're almost up to the depot. And we're headed, yeah, we're headed into the depot. So, and when we get done with that, we're back. You can see where the switch is uh, standing down here. Here's the switch is the crossover. They've already, we've already backed across. We're headed down toward East Auburn. Well, no, he, he's he's still going to, to Auburn. He's not at there yet. Okay. And. Uh, He's not scheduled to arrive there until 10.13. Okay. So it would be fairly dark on most days at <laughs> this point. Um, so this is a good example of one that we're showing you, of course, another train, uh, but it's, it's the same action. Yeah. So here again, we're going down to the depot, and then we're going to back around the Seattle leg of the Y. I mean, hey, and straight down I'm into clear. Wait Auburn. So we will be um, facing. Uh, here Here we are in the mode where we're getting ready to, to uh, set up for the, uh, for the Y. 
and he's uh, switched genders down there, and he's ready to, to market. Um, this backing move then puts you uh, going the other way into the East Auburn uh, siding. So he's waiting now for uh, train two from that's leaving, of course, Seattle at about 9.30, and uh, take, they've scheduled for uh, really arriving here at uh, 10.35, so it's about an hour from Seattle to East Auburn in those days. This is, by the way, a schedule was set up for early 50s. Now, just before they, they went to the higher speed, which actually moved the train uh, earlier in the day, so the... the uh, so now, when when you're here, you notice that there are passengers on the line. So they've already gotten off the the connection, and they're they're waiting for the uh, the North Coast Limited to come through. And here here's the North Coast Limited. This is obviously after the change and all that good stuff. But <laughs> the same thing with twenty six as it was with number two was the same. Same operation, just a different time of the day. So it would be at night was number two. So anyway, uh, North Coast Limited is uh, scheduled to leave uh, East Auburn at 1045. So they gave them uh, 10 minutes to make the transfer and all. And uh, at that point, uh, we are going to leave East Auburn to come around the, the Tacoma side of the yeah, the switch tender north end of Albert Yard would have, he'd have some of the in inside tracks line. We would line the, the hand throw switch um, to go into the Seattle leg. We'd have to line ourselves around this outer ooh, south leg of the Y, and the switch tender line us through the yard track, get the get the switch engines out of the way and let us out on the, the main line. And we'd, by that time, we had our white signals up and we'd run extra back to the coal, no stops. Good. So here, here is a picture, uh, again, leaving another uh, connection, leaving uh, uh, Auburn uh, with, with a extra equipment. Um, <clears throat> well, I, you I, could I, open it up. I'd rather and, imagine that's a scheduled train. I don't see any white flags. So yes, that's well. We're not going. We're not going to be nitpicky on that point. Yeah, <laughs> all these things. You know, you get into the rule books, and these things are important. Like I say, when you're carrying green signals, that means you have other sections of that train. The train is not complete. And if you looked in the rule book, when you pass another train in the yard or other, other on the road, you'd blow a long and too short, and they're supposed to answer with two shorts. And if they didn't, you're supposed to stop and find out why, because they're not acknowledging the fact that, that your train is not complete. It's because you're a superior train, and, and uh, these. Little details show up, and those flags were, they look to the rule books, they're important. And that was the fireman's job to put them up and take them down. But if you didn't take them down, coming in a roundhouse, you'd get a call from the roundhouse for them. So, not always. Sometimes they'd take care of you. But you'd say, you go back down here and take those flags out and put them in the box. <laughs> little box. One of these photos shows. It's right around the, the front running board, the little box with the flag. And those things were important because you remember there was no radio communication and uh, it was all by signals. Same way of putting out a flag, you know, you'd call out a flag. When you call the flag in, um, from the east was five long and from the west, four long. Okay. And, uh, that was the way of remembering the rule where more people lived in the East than lived in the West. <laughs> it took more 
whistles to call them in with the flagman. It was all done by seat of the pants. We have all these radios now communicating. It's hard to realize what a well, this is obviously a regular train. You don't see any white flags there. That's a scheduled train. Yes. And uh, this is an interesting uh, movement. Uh, again, this is south of uh, Auburn, the connection south of Auburn. And uh, it's got a business car. Do we must have done grab that off the rear end of the of train? Took it off the uh, rear end of the train and put it on the connection, took it to Tacoma because that was where it was headed. <laughs> so the railroad ended up using the connection as a, a way of transferring equipment. And so um, once once you come back, you you go around the loop and, and come in to the to the depot and then you, you place your cars. Well, we had a track for the connection the same track they'd use in the morning. We'd cut off our train and, and uh, head over in yard, we're in yard limits now, of course. We'd head over and put our locomotive in the inbound track to home. Uh, and effectively, that was the end of, end of that you, job. You were... Generally, we could make our two round trips on a tank of water with tanks on the MT and Engines were not very big, but uh, I don't recall having it. You couldn't get it. When you look at the timetable, it says there's water at Tacoma, but that's a, a, a trap because there's no water on the main line. You want water, you had to get into the roundhouse, and that's going to be a kind of an involved process. <laughs> if it's a, uh, I know the Great Northern trains uh, running south. A lot of times, if they were delayed in Seattle and Terminal, they'd take water at Auburn because it was on the main line, right by the north end of the Arctic, and because they couldn't get it at Tacoma. The next water was Kepton, which is south of Silicon. And if they were going over the prairie line, which a lot of their trains did at one time, they, they wouldn't have any water till they got to, um, I guess, to the I know where right. Sentry. Well, um, to remind Ky Cairo, or this. Well, anyway, the timetable had a lot of little symbols. And you had to look at water, yard limits, and it uh, gave you a lot of information you needed to have a successful trip. Well, did anything else you want to talk about on the on the connection? Um, not much to it. It was a nice job. It worked seven days a week, of course. There were no Sundays off. And uh, it, uh, you, know, you know, it just paid a basic day. But it was regular and uh, fairly, sh it was an afternoon job. We were generally done by 10.30 to 11 o'clock and so on. And uh, I enjoyed it. And uh, working with Max and uh, Doing our little uh, Tacoma News Tribune uh, contributions was there was a part of Leonard Road in my my life and very good okay and thank you can, can you, can you, any questions you want to do questions yeah yeah anything you... yeah so we're gonna we, thanks guys that was a great presentation you know. I've I've been with you guys a number of different times, and every time I watch this sequence, I just learned something more interesting about, you know, like the flag thing today and knowing that there's... So, Jack, then that box would have white flags and green flags? The, the, that little box, picture, here's a couple of pictures, you could see that box. Okay. It just had a little hook in it, you know, and uh, I don't know if you... And, uh, there were holes in the back of the box, and the flag staffs, okay. which are about a half inch pipe, they went through the holes in the back of this little box. Oh, here. Okay. And, yeah. Now, they were pretty handy because that's where you needed them because of, you put them up here right behind the classification lights. So, if you're a regular passenger train, you, you didn't like these. Well, 
But if you were extra, you'd light the lights, put the flags. So, so you were only scheduled when you had passengers on the train, and you were an extra when you were running light with just the coaches. Yeah, well, when you're running light, if yeah, if you're running extra, you had to carry white flags. The white flags. And if, if so, if you were on a passenger job, like during the war when Number Two had quite a few sections, they'd all be carrying green signals except the last one. And yeah, that, what did that, the last one have. And if anybody was in a siding up there somewhere on between Auburn and Yakima, they'd have to wait till they got a train with no signals going by before they stuck their nose out to go Look. go the other direction. And so it was all done as soon as all visuals. There was no no uh, No radios, no, no cell phones. No none of that. No phone, no light, no motor no, cars. Nothing with us. No. Yeah, not a single luxury. Yeah. Gosh, this is great, guys. So, you know, one thing I sort of forgot to mention at the beginning of this program, because this is a PNRA Zoom program, normally uh, we would all be remote in, in doing this all virtually. But today, of course, we're live. And so I want to say hi to all of our guests in our audience that are watching on Zoom. And I also want a special welcome to all of the people of the future that will watch this program on YouTube. So welcome, people of the future. May you be AI, intelligent life forms, or whatever you may be at some future juncture. So if anybody in our audience today has a question, uh, now would be a super great time to enter that question into the chat. We have Virginia Wright, our executive director at the Pacific Northwest Railroad Archive, monitoring the chat. And so now is a great time to ask that question. So, Jack, how long did you work on the Tacoma Connection with Max? Well, I'm kind of kind of vague on that. See, I didn't keep very. I only have two or three time books. If I thought anybody would be interested in this stuff, fifty years, sixty years later, I probably would have saved more of them. Yeah. One thing, thing when I was road foreman of engines, you had to file a monthly report right. to the master mechanic and superintendent, and they always generally, uh, sometimes the clerk would do it for me, but you made out your own, I'd generally make a carbon so I'd have a record of it. And for some reason, I hung on to that. Ordinarily, when I quit that job, which I did because it wasn't union and I, they weren't paying enough. Right, and this was couldn't the afford it, actually. Yeah. When I left that job, ordinarily, I would have just trashed it. And I had no thought that anybody would be interested in this stuff. Well, you know, like... Yeah. Actually, we, most of these people are from all walks of life, they didn't work on the railroad. Some of them were pretty heavy hitters in their own field. Sure. You know, like, look at Bill Zidell. He's the vice president of J.P. Morgan Stanley. I know. I know. Pre pretty heavy, you know. Oh, yeah. Respected uh, guy. Why, 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 was, why is he so interested in the Northern Pacific? But it's, you know, you could just bask in the reflective glory of the railroads. <laughs> so, was this the only place Otherwise, that you... Otherwise, no, but who's going to be interested in 98-year-old geezer? To... Well, not Jack, quite, we are. Not quite 98 yet. But... Yeah, I know. I know. Rounding up again as usual. A couple months, but... It's... Yeah, yeah. So, we've got a question from the audience. Uh, what were the passenger cars on the connection? Some of the now smaller windows than regular coaches. Boy, <laughs> that could be for either Gat, Jack, or Gary. So it looked like to me that you'd have a couple of two or three coaches, and and and, and then a lot of mail. It looked like, right? Yeah, we had the, we had usually have a baggage mail car, and a lot of that stuff was pretty old, old heavyweight equipment. As far as the windows are concerned, uh, I think they were mostly the twelve hundred. Standard 1200 heavyweight. Yeah, There's never much uh, yeah. involved, I guess, not much interest in the, the coaches themselves. Yeah. Well, you're busy we're looking at the locomotives. So we got another question from the audience. Go ahead, please. So I'm curious. The last pictures it looked like on the train in 1954 was still drawn by steam. Was steam last, was 1954 the last year they used steam? Sure. Well, yeah. The last steam on the NP was 58, but it was pretty well, pretty well. Uh, Gone by 54, 55, 
I think in '56 they went to buses. Yeah. Uh, so they 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 re- yeah, and, and yeah, they, they always use steam on it. They never. So when they ship it to this to buses and that. Yeah. Shortly after the uh, the new Northfield Limited went on, I think that's they switched to buses. Just yeah. too expensive, you know. And yeah. Uh, but um, no, I some of that stuff is like I say. If I thought people would be interested, I'd have kept better records. Because there is a fireman, you had to keep your own. You know, the engineers had the copy of their time slip for their records. And uh, I, I kept, I got all of those from the time I came back from Montana. Um, and uh, I guess PNRA has got all of that stuff now. There you go. Yeah, it's, yeah. people yeah. think it's interesting. Yeah. Speaking well, of interesting, we've got another question from our Zoom audience. Virginia, go ahead, please. From Dirk Foster. I have a question about the trip. How you train was trying to set up with the Auburn Depot since that move would have been against the financial traffic. Were there yards limits covering the area of the depot that permits such a move? Also, I have one of Maxi's articles from the CHC probably in 67. Wow. Yeah. George Foster from Hermiston, Idaho. So, Jack, did you get the question? Well, it was just at the north end of the yard. Okay. Let's give it to me again, Virginia. I have a question about how the train was turned and set over to Auburn Depot since that move would be against the trunk of traffic. Were the yard limits covering the area of the depot that permit such a move? Well, because you'd cross over to the northbound, you'd be pushing northbound on the southbound main or southbound on the northbound main or something. Is that like going that. through the yard now on the main line? So, okay, going through the yard would be one example. How far north, Gary, did yard limits go in Auburn? Did they go past the old Auburn Depot? Oh, yeah, the yard limits are well out both uh, north of the depot, I don't know, maybe a mile out at least. And on the south end, down around the Stuck River Bridge, is yard limits. And then there was also out to East Auburn. East Auburn, that was all yard limits. Oh, East too. Auburn was all yard limits too yeah. then. So you were. Uh, and, you know, and during yard, and yard limits, uh, all you had to clear was first class trains. So, you, but, uh, okay. You could make those moves. Uh, and of course, once, like I say, once you made the connection, you were a scheduled train. Like you could back around after you, like if after you meet number five, for instance. You'd follow them out, you'd back around on yard limits. You were extra. Once you got to Auburn Depot, you were a regular train. You could bring in that connection from number five into Tacoma. And you uh, you were running with the current of traffic, of course. And if you had to run on the main line outside the yard limits against the current of traffic, you'd have to tell a train order to do so. Okay. And did you? Where else did you work with Max King? Uh I don't know. I've I've got a time slip with him. Uh, he was probably just catch his catch kid. Well, we had this job called the Everett Turn. Came out after midnight out of Auburn. Went up to Everett as a short trip, and uh, we'd be up there. We we go out get. Go to work a little after midnight. We'd get up to Everett about five or six in the morning. And we had to go over the Great Northern from the Snohomish. And we generally go on our rest or when our train was ready. And the idea was to, to grab all the high revenue stuff, long east stuff that we competed with the Great Northern for. We had to suck that out of Everett and get it down to Auburn and get it on. Uh, number 602 or later number 600, get it on our hot train east. So that every turn, you went up there and you you generally got tied up by 5 or 6 in the morning. Okay. And you went to work either on your rest or when the train was ready about 4 or 5 in the afternoon. And you were back in Auburn by 10. And you only worked, you had a Monday, Wednesday, Friday group and a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. I remember working with Max with the 1823, which is a W3. And we just called him. I've got a, I've got the, his time from that, that trip. 
But uh, most of the other trips with Max were just, I guess, as an extra man. I can't remember being assigned on an assigned job with him for a long time. But you'd catch different engineers at different times. Most of the time, I worked the extra list. You know? Okay. But Jack would have to be one of your favorite engineers, or Max would be one of your oh, yeah. favorite engineers, wouldn't he? And uh, yeah, we'd work on our stories, and he'd tell me how famous we were going to be. And of course, we weren't. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> well, you are now. <laughs> so we've got a question in the audience from Kurt Armbruster, uh, uh, editor of the Main Streeter magazine. Kurt, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this was considered a high seniority job. Well, anything that was regular hours, it was not very much. It was kind of a low paid job, but it was fairly short hours, and um, just the regularity of it was a fraction. Now, seven days a week job. What did you do when you wanted a day off? Well, you can. You, you can, if you wanted, you could ask for a day off, and they'd ship the guy over to. They did have a fireman from Auburn, extra board, who worked the job. But one day, if you had to be off, you'd have to have a good reason because it wasn't, wasn't that great for pay, but, you know, it was equal to a little better than the yard engine, I guess. But, okay, and Virginia says we've got a couple of more questions coming in from the chat. Thanks, chat. Viewers, Virginia, go ahead, please. Question from Mark Maccabee. Who were some of the conductors? Oh, boy. That's a good question. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. I'm, I'm having a senior moment now. But... <laughs> so you're entitled. Senior moment with a senior <laughs> audience. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can put a face on them, um, but I, I really can't. can't re we had one guy that, uh, I don't know if he would work on that connection. In the past year, there was a guy named Benny Eckler. Uh, there was another one called Carnation Bob. Carnation Bob. He was, uh, he was uh, a, uh, a black man, or I mean, he was, a, you know, partial, and he was a pretty elegant guy, and his... He got that uh, uh, moniker because he always had a, a red card, and he was a pretty elegant dresser, pretty neat guy. <laughs> um, yeah, I think as um, conductors, I remember uh, uh, like Fred Sampson, who was a, a neighbor of mine. I don't remember what, what I work with. I know I, well, when I worked, I'd come in, I was living with my folks at that time, and I'd be cut, tie up at three or four in the morning, and he lived a kind of few doors down from our house on the other side. Of I'd see a light in the kitchen. I'd go in there, and he'd just tied up from some other job, and we'd do a little old heading, you know, railroading in the middle of the night, drinking coffee. But... If you gave me a list of names of conductors, I could pick out ones that I remember. <laughs> I actually, uh, when I came back from Montana and had to work over the Great Northern, what really impressed me was how how hospitable they were, how much they helped me. And I can remember the Great Northern conductors better than I can ours. <laughs> uh, there was, and they were some really gung ho guys, you know. We had a lot of good guys, too. Yeah, of course you did, like you. Yeah. So now, while you were talking about meeting your neighbor and having coffee and talking railroading in the middle of the night, were there a lot of railroad employees in the neighborhood where you grew up and lived? Oh, we were all in the East End. I don't know of anybody real close to us, but it was a railroad town. You know? Sure. And uh, it, uh, yeah, the, 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 the the whole town was, uh, he supplied the railroad people. It was the main generator of... It's what people did for a living. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I can honestly say that in 57 years, work, yeah, I only met a couple of guys that I did, well, one or two that I despised. 
and maybe three or four that were in prison, but by and large, they were a pretty damn nice bunch of people. Right. And they all had their, his, they had their little way to sit in proceeds, but um, it was, uh, and that goes for the Tacoma Division and the, the Lake Superior and the, and the St. Paul Division and the Rocky Mountain. The only ones I didn't work on were the Yellowstone and the Idaho, I guess, and the Fargo. In Fargo, okay. Bill Kubler takes care of that. There you go. Now, do we still have any more questions? We, we have more questions we're, you know, from Virginia. Go ahead, Virginia. Eric Bandemore, did the connecting train actually drop passengers at the Auburn Depot or does it the the boat backing up the East Auburn Depot? Um, well, well, that's a good question here. On the first trip with, when you went up there, I presume our going up the first trip we did and we don't we didn't get near the depot. Okay. So we'd head through the yard around the east over. Right. After we backed around after number like with number five after they left we'd back around so you could get you could get on at East Auburn and ride over to Auburn if you're so inclined. And if you just wanted to go that far, I guess, you could sneak on there. The same way with number two, of course. You were going out with passengers there. Right. You could get off. I presume you could get off at, at, at Auburn if you wanted to. Uh, uh, Timetable, sure, sure. Yeah. But it would be a stop. Maybe you would be interested in going on him further, but I you could you buy a ticket from East Auburn to Auburn. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, you could get a, you could, uh, like coming out of number two, you could yeah. get, probably get a ticket to Auburn because you had to stop there to, to back around I presume. Yeah, yeah. Well, the e the the westbound ones were particularly dropping it. They didn't drop the person at East Auburn unless they wanted to get off there. But if they wanted to go to Auburn, they had to get on the connection because they didn't stop the transcontinental at Auburn Depot. Yeah. It, it went on into Seattle. Yeah, number two, I usually stop at Auburn. Yeah. He just went over to East. He had to get out of East Auburn. Can you start with number five and not in Auburn? Pop, just went straight on the cell. Yep. Okay. Well, Jack, anything more for the good of the order here while, you, while you're thinking about it? Well, <laughs> I'm sure you got something up your sleeve. I guess I need. Yeah, there's, there's always a lot of good stories, I guess. But well, sure there are. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But uh, I know the. Uh, there's a lot of stories of the Main Streeter. I've got a book out, and I don't make any money on that, but you can get that I don't know, through the NPRHA or the yeah, PMRA. Right. Yeah, right. We've got They've got them in the store. Yeah. You know. And uh, uh, most of it is true, I think. Yeah, or at least it was a good story at the time. <laughs> yes. Like, Eric, remember Eric Hoffer, that longshoreman philosopher? He said a lot of the things like, I talk about doing it when I was younger. Maybe I didn't do them, but I thought I did. Yeah, there you go. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. This concludes the first part of today's program. We're going to take a break for about an hour, and we'll be back at 1 p.m. for our regularly scheduled PNRA Zoom meeting, at which time uh, Gary and Jack will be back again, and Gary will be leading a discussion on the development of Northern Pacific passenger steam power. So I will uh, look forward to seeing uh, everybody back. And uh, thank you very much for enjoying the first part of today's program. Thank you, and uh, bye, for the, bye for now. So there you have it. <laughs>